Dinosaur King is a media franchise created and owned by Sega where dinosaurs transform to and from cards and can be summoned by people to do battle with one another. There's an arcade game, a DS game, a two season anime and trading card game or TCG. Dinosaurs are categorized into one of seven elements, lightning, earth, grass, wind, fire, water, or secret. In this series, I'll be going through and analyzing the scientific accuracy of the species within each element. In this video, we're going to be looking at the earth element, home to the armored stegosaurs and ankylosaurs, who formed the larger clade Thyreophora. As you'd expect, they often use rocks, crystals, features of the earth, and geological processes against opponents, which is pretty entertaining seeing such heavily armed creatures performing such athletic feats. Sadly, there are no basal Thyreophorans like Solidosaurus or Scutellosaurus, which would have been cool to see, but it's not a big deal. In Dinosaur King, the Stegosaur models all have spikes at the tips of their tails, and they correctly point to the sides. They have the correct number of toes with three, all with claws, as they should have, which is great. However, they've also been restored with four fingers, all with claws, whereas Stegosaurs had five fingers and only the innermost two had claws. Another common issue many, if not all, the Stegosaurs have is that their legs are too long compared to their arms. The first Stegosaur we'll be looking at is Tujangosaurus. Its name means Tuo River Lizard, as it was nearby to where it was first discovered in China in rock data to the late Jurassic, roughly 160 million years ago. Whilst the skull is incompletely known, it might be slightly too long based on the material we do have. The only other thing to note is that it's unknown whether this genus had shoulder spikes, but considering many other stegosaurs had them and there's no direct evidence to refute it, I think it's fine that this model has them. The plates also look to be correctly shaped and arranged, and it has the four-spiked Thagomizer, like most stegosaurs. Strangely, the TCG art has five fingers for some reason, albeit all with claws, but it's an odd case of artwork and accuracy inconsistencies. On the whole though, this one is great. Next up is Gigant Spinosaurus, which despite sounding like the two largest theropods combined, is in fact a stegosaur. Its name means giant spined lizard and was actually a contemporary of Tujangosaurus. The head is mostly speculative as only the lower jaw is known and the neck looks to be the right length. The genus is most famous for its distinct shoulder spikes. Whilst their exact positions in life are unknown, most reconstructions I've seen have them stood vertically, curving over the back rather than sideways over the flanks. Regardless, I'm pretty sure their bases should be broader than is seen here. The plates look to be correctly shaped. However, they appear quite large, but in life, the keratin sheath may have made them look this big, so it's plausible. Overall, another solid model. Next is Kentrosaurus. If you watched the video I did on the lightning element, you'll already know that its name means sharp pointed lizard, and it lived in Tanzania during the late Jurassic, roughly 150 million years ago. Its head looks to be too long and rectangular, when the skull has a shorter, more triangular shape and profile. The shoulder spikes look like they may be too high and above the actual shoulder blade when it should be attached to it. The plates are correctly shaped and transition to spikes over the hips and down the tail. Said spikes are really big, and again, I'm sure the keratin sheath in life would make this at least possible, but they do look really, really long. This genus either has no thagomizer or has a much more widely spaced one than most genera, which is correctly reconstructed here. Overall, I'd say this is one of the weaker stegosaur models. Up next, we have an interesting case with Decentrurus from late Jurassic and possibly also early Cretaceous Europe. Originally named Omosaurus in 1875, this name was already taken by a reptile from the Triassic. Many species were assigned to this genus before it was renamed in 1902 to Decentrurus. Most of these specimens have since been moved to other taxa. 
The name De Centrurus means tail full of points, a fitting name considering that, similar to Kentrosaurus, its plates transition to spikes over the hips and down the tail. As such, it should be immediately apparent that this model is lacking this distinctive feature, instead having plates running the length of its tail, with the typical thagomizer at the tip, when it's thought to more closely resemble Kentrosaurus. Not only do the plates extend further than they should, they're the wrong shape and too small. Whilst the skull is unknown for this genus, the closer related and potentially synonymous Mira Gaia, which was named and described later in 2009, does preserve some skull elements and it seems a bit too short. Mira Gaia is famous for having an incredibly long neck for a stegosaur, and some reconstruct Decentrurus with a similarly long neck. As this genus's neck is poorly understood, I won't critique it. It's also said to only be about 4 meters long, when in reality it was double this length. This is also an example of the TCG art giving a dinosaur the correct 5 fingers for some reason. Overall, this is probably the weakest Stegosaur model, as it doesn't really resemble Decentrurus that much. Next we have another interesting one with Lexoesaurus from mid to late Jurassic Europe. This animal has a complex taxonomic history. The material this name refers to was originally classified as a species of Omosaurus in 1887, which itself was renamed to Decentrurus in 1915 until it was given its own genus name in 1957. Its name means Lexoe lizard, after the Lexoe, a Gallic tribe from Normandy during the Iron Age and Roman period. To add more confusion, in 2008, most of the Lexoesaurus material has itself been split off into a new genus. Genus, Lorikatosaurus. As such, this model may actually represent the latter genus instead, as Lexoesaurus is now very fragmentary and difficult to reconstruct. The skull is not known, but this looks fairly reasonable. Whilst it was once thought to have shoulder spikes, these have since been re-identified as tail spikes, but this was unknown at the time. This model does feature what are now Lorikatosaurus's distinct keeled plates, which is good as well as them transitioning to spikes partway down the tail. It's unknown how many tail spikes it would have had, nor if it had a thagomizer, so I won't critique this model for it. So on the whole, for a fairly fragmentary genus, for the time it's oddly really good. Next is the most famous member and the group's namesake, Stegosaurus, aka Armatus in the anime. Its name means roof lizard, and it lived in North America during the late Jurassic, roughly 150 million years ago. In 2015, Stegosaurus underwent a makeover thanks to the discovery of Sophie, a nearly complete subadult that gave clarity on the animal's proportions. As such, by modern standards, the neck and the tail should both be longer with the latter drooping towards the tip. The head might also be slightly too long, but I could be wrong. It's quite difficult to discern what species this model is meant to represent. My best guess would be, given the name of the anime Stegosaurus, this is meant to be the now dubious genus S. Armatus. Otherwise, I'd guess it's an S. Stenops. The plates are the correct shape and in the right positions, along with having a thagomizer. Unless I'm mistaken, you can just barely make out throat armour on the model, which the real animal is known to have had, which is excellent. Whilst it is now outdated, for the time, this is fantastic. The last Stegosaur is fittingly perhaps the last to ever live, Warehosaurus, which lived in Asia during the early Cretaceous, roughly 110 million years ago. Its name means Wareho Lizard, after the Chinese city of the same name near to where it was discovered. Whilst it was first thought to have had very short plates, as are seen here, this was an illusion caused by the fossilised plate being broken. It's unknown what they looked like in life, as the genus is only known from fragmentary remains. As such, all reconstructions of this animal are highly speculative. The skull is among the unknown elements, so I can't fairly critique it, but it looks reasonable. It's unknown whether it had a thagomizer, but it's also reasonable to assume it did, based on other genera. What is known about Warehosaurus is that it had very broad hips, suggesting it had a wide belly, and it also had short limbs. 
This reconstruction appears to be about as wide and long-legged as the other stegosaurs though. Considering it's almost impossible to fully reconstruct, it's pretty good. Now we move on to the other main branch of Thyreophora, the ankylosaurs. There have been two discoveries and subsequent papers in recent years that have majorly reshuffled the ankylosaur family tree. Traditionally, ankylosauria has been split into two families, ankylosaurids, those with tail clubs, and nodosaurids, those without tail clubs. However, in 2021, the discovery of the genus Stegoros helped to define a new group, the Parankylosaurs, a sister group to the nodosaurids and ankylosaurids collectively called Euankylosaurs. Later in 2023, the paper describing the genus Vectipelta massively reshuffled the entirety of Ankylosauria, with nodosaurids being split into three new families, Polycanthidae, Struthiosauridae, and Panoplosauridae. On top of this, the members of Parankylosauria, as well as some traditional nodosaurids, have been moved to completely different parts of the family tree. I've decided to group the rest of the ankylosaurs into the more traditional nodosaurids and ankylosaurids just for the sake of simplicity for this video. When it comes to the traditional quote-unquote nodosaurs, all those seen in Dinosaur King lived during the Cretaceous. After some painstaking research, as far as I can tell, most nodosaurs have five fingers, with only the innermost three having claws, and four toes, all with claws. This is based on trackways referred to the ichnotaxon Tetrapodosaurus, thought to have been made by nodosaurs. The models here have four fingers, all with claws, with some exceptions, which I'll bring up when we get to them. The first genus we'll be looking at is Gastonia. It is named after its discoverer, Robert Gaston, and it lived around 140 to 135 million years ago in Utah. Many skulls of Gastonia are known, and this looks correct to me. The arrangement of its osteoderm armour is incompletely known, as the torso armour has never been found in articulation. The neck armour of Gastonia differs from most ankylosaurs, as they typically have two half rings of armour with four segments each. However, Gastonias only have two segments. Here it is incorrectly reconstructed with more typical four segmented half rings. The neck may also be too short. Whilst the scutes on the torso are known, their positions in life are not. A common speculation is that the large curved scoot formed a pair between the shoulders close to the back's midline and formed part of several rows across the back. Whilst these are present, they're too straight and all the scoots are probably too big. Other large curved and flat scoots are speculated to form rows down the flanks and gradually become smaller towards the tail. Likewise, the tail had a similar arrangement that became smaller towards the tip, as well as having a pair of smaller scoots on the top of the tail. Like all nodosaurs, the hips were covered by a sacral shield, a huge mass of flat bone covered in small osteoderms. Its surface texture in life is unknown, so I won't critique it. Considering how speculative the armour arrangement is for this genus, this model is pretty good. Up next we have one of the most famous members, Polacanthus. Its name means many thorns, and it lived in England 130 to 125 million years ago. Despite being one of the first genera known and one of the group's namesakes, Polacanthus is not well known. As such, most reconstructions are based on the more completely known Gastonia, with which it is thought to be closely related and placed in the family Polacanthidae. The skull is almost entirely unknown, so I won't comment on its accuracy. Most researchers have speculated that the large keeled osteoderms formed horizontal rows down the torso and the tail. Whilst these are present on the tail, they are completely absent from the torso. It does feature large keeled scoots on the back's midline and the base of the tail, but nowhere else. Whilst it's unknown what arrangement the armour had, this feels like incredibly minimal armour covering compared to other genera like Gastonia. I appreciate this animal is difficult to reconstruct, but 
I don't think this one is well done, as when in doubt, you should turn to an animal's closest relatives to reconstruct it, and this doesn't really resemble any nodosaur I know of. Not a big fan. The next genus, Sauropelta, whose name means lizard shield, lived in North America roughly 108 million years ago. It is one of the most completely known nodosaurs, as its armour was found in articulation. The skull looks to be correct, however the armour on the neck is now thought to consist of two pairs of rows of three spikes, but this model only has one pair of rows. Triangular scutes formed horizontal rows down the flanks and the tail, which are correctly reconstructed here. Its most distinct feature were the giant shoulder spikes. Whether these were oriented upwards or downwards is unknown, so I won't critique this model's upwards reconstruction. The rest of the scutes were small and dome-shaped, and formed many rows across the torso and tail, which is also correctly reconstructed here. Aside from the neck armour, this Sauropelta model is superbly done, probably thanks to its amazing level of preservation. Next up we have Panoplosaurus. Its name means well-armoured lizard, and it lived in Canada 75 million years ago. It had a very distinct, lumpy skull that is accurately reconstructed here. It has several types of scutes, with those on the neck having very wide bases and low keels. These are partly represented here, but they're only on the top of the neck when they should form these signature neck half rings. The arrangement on the body and tail are unknown, but the long, low scutes transitioning into smaller, rounder scutes over the back and the rows of more conical scutes forming horizontal rows on the flanks are a common speculation, so I'd say it's pretty reasonable. It's possible Panoplosaurus had only three fingers, unlike other nodosaurs, but this may be due to the other fingers not being preserved. Regardless, the model has the typical four fingers like most of the other Nodosaur models. Overall, this model is really good. Next we have Edmontonia. It is named after the town of Edmonton in Canada, near where it was discovered, and it lived from 76 to 69 million years ago. Edmontonia is one of the most famous and completely known nodosaurs. The head is perfectly reconstructed, as is the shape and arrangement of the osteoderms, with broad, low-keeled scutes on the neck half rings and between the shoulders. These transition into thinner, low-keeled scutes over the back and tail. There were also horizontal rows of large curved spikes down its flanks and tail. At the shoulders, they were especially large and projected outwards and curved forwards. Based on the large size of its shoulder spikes, this model most likely represents the older species, E. rugosidens. Even still, the spikes are probably too large. It's possible Edmontonia also had less fingers than normal, with only four fingers known. However, it may have just not been preserved. On the whole, the Edmontonia is almost flawless. A wonderful model of this animal. Lastly, we have the old Nodosaur group's namesake genus, Nodosaurus. Despite this, it is also a poorly understood genus. Its name means knobbed lizard, and it lived in North America roughly 99 million years ago. It, along with Edmontonia and Panoplosaurus, are placed in the family Panoplosauridae. What is known of this animal is that its body was mostly covered in rows of small, knobbly scutes, which give the animal its name. Whilst this reconstruction has only these types of scutes across the entire body, it has been speculated that it also had larger, spike-like scutes, similar to other, more completely known genera. It's therefore very difficult to reconstruct the animal entirely. The skull is unknown, but this looks reasonable. The neck does look quite short compared to other nodosaurs though. For whatever reason, Nodosaurus is given the correct five fingers unlike all the other nodosaurs. I can't really comment on how accurate this model is as it's just too incompletely known to judge. The last of the ankylosaurs and the earth dinosaurs are the ankylosaurids which as a family has persisted through the many reshufflings of the group. All the definitive members seen in Dinosaur King are members of the subfamily Ankylosaurinae, which all have tail clubs and are from the late Cretaceous of North America and Asia. 
they have the correct number of toes with three, but the wrong number of fingers, as they have four when they should have five, with one exception which I'll get to. They also all have claws when only the innermost three should have them. First up we have Panacosaurus, meaning Plank Lizard. It lived in Asia around 75 million years ago. It's debated whether there were two species or just one, as there's some variation with the horns on the skull. If there are two, this appears to represent P. mephistocephalus rather than P. grangeri, which had considerably larger horns. A signature feature of this genus is its unusually small club. Here it may be too large though, but it does appear to be roughly the correct shape. The osteoderms also appear to be the wrong shape and in the wrong arrangement. They're known to have large triangular scutes on the sides of the torso and tail, and are thought to have had far more scutes over the back that were generally lower than just the two rows seen here. The torso should also be much broader and flatter. The legs may also be too long. Overall, other than the head, it's not the best portrayal of Pinacosaurus, I'm afraid. Up next we have Cychania, aka Tank from the anime. Its name means Beautiful One, and it lived in Asia roughly 75 to 70 million years ago. I love that they went for a more obscure genus to be one of the main six dinosaurs in the show, rather than the more famous Ankylosaurus. As for the actual model, the head looks to be perfect, with quite large osteoderms on the top of the head and very large nostrils and eight horns. Cychania might be the most heavily armoured of all ankylosaurs, with even the front legs and breastbone having osteoderms. The arrangement of the scoots also looks spot on from what we know, which is amazing. However, they're much too large and most of them are too conical when they should be keeled like the armour of crocodilians. The tail club shape is unknown as the holotype specimen only preserved the front half of the animal. Huge tail clubs have been found, but it's unknown whether these belong to Cychania, so I won't critique it as it looks plausible to me. Tank is shown to be quite large in the anime, however the real animal is thought to be closer to 5 or 6 meters long. On the whole, Cychania looks wonderful. Next we have Tarchia, a contemporary of Cychania. Fittingly, its name means brainy one, as it was found to have a larger brain case than Cychania, which was named and described in the same paper in 1977. I believe this model is based on material now referred to the species T. Therese. This model looks to be almost perfect, aside from the torso perhaps being slightly too narrow. The head ornamentation, the shape of the scoots, and the tail club all look spot on. It's possible Tarchia had more scoots in life, but its armour is incompletely known, so aside from the aforementioned issues with its fingers, this is a fantastic reconstruction. Up next is Talarurus. Its name means basket tail and it lived in Mongolia around 90 million years ago. This animal is known from several incomplete specimens and as such most reconstructions, especially museum mounts, are composites of many different individuals. This resulted in a lot of odd features now seen as inaccurate. One of these was that it was reconstructed with four toes, despite other ankylosaurids having three. This inaccuracy is present on this model, much like the others. However, for whatever reason, the Talarurus alone was given an extra finger, giving it the correct number of five. The skull has a distinctly thin snout, and this is correctly shown here. The tail club is the correct shape, and the scutes are also the correct shape and arranged correctly compared to most reconstructions I've seen. On the whole, the Talarurus model is honestly really good. The next genus, Euoplocephalus, lived in Canada around 75 million years ago. It is another example where a lot of specimens referred to it at the time have since been moved to other genera. Looking at the head, it appears to still resemble that of the specimen still referred to Euoplocephalus based on its straight horns. The name Euoplocephalus actually means well-armed head. Similar to the Cychania, the arrangement of the scoots looks to be correct, however they're too large and some of them are the wrong shape. 
For example, the larger scoots between the shoulders are roughly the right shape, but are way too big. They do correctly shrink as they proceed over the back. The club is now incorrect for Euoplocephalus, as the pointed shape is now considered a feature of Anodontosaurus. Euoplocephalus should now have a round club. For the time though, on the whole, it's really good. The last ankylosaur and earth dinosaur is the group's namesake, Ankylosaurus. Its name means fused lizard and it lived 68 to 66 million years ago in North America. The head is slightly off as its upper horns appear to angle too far downwards when they should be slightly more vertical. The snout might also be slightly too narrow. The osteoderms are very strange. Ankylosaurus had a mix of keeled and flat scoots. However, on this model, they're not only huge, but inaccurately uniform. Whilst the scoots for Ankylosaurus are known, their arrangement in life is not. And as such, several arrangements have been suggested. Here, they form very tight rows across the entire back and tail. This, however, would likely have massively restricted its movement. Speaking of the tail, the tail club is at least the correct shape. On the whole, this is not the best reconstruction of Ankylosaurus, unfortunately. Dinosaur King's Earth element is quite the mixed bag when it comes to how well it holds up in terms of accuracy. It's not a case of the Ankylosaurs are good, but the Stegosaurs are bad, or vice versa. Rather, it's very inconsistent across the board, with members of both lineages having several hits and misses. I'd also like to thank my good friend, The Cobra Effect, and recommend you check out my friend and fellow Paleo YouTuber, The Casual Prince Ace, and his videos on Dinosaur King if you're a fan. Thank you guys so much for watching, and please do check out my other videos and subscribe, as it helps a ton. Bye bye now.